This week we're exploring the area around Duncan in the beautiful Cowichan Valley here on Vancouver Island. This area is renowned for its wonderful food and we're going to go and find out some more about it. With its temperate climate and fertile soil, the Cowichan Valley is ideal farming country and has become well known for the variety and quality of its food. Duncan, its unofficial capital, grew up around the Esquimalt and Nanaimo rail line which arrived in the 1880s. But the area has been home to the Coast Salish and Cowichan peoples for at least 6,000 years. Their traditional way of life is featured in the magnificent Quetzan Cultural Centre on the banks of the Cowichan River. Duncan today is home to a thriving farmer's market and our first stop. Now you may think that all we seem to do on this show is eat, but there are days when we have to grab something quick and delicious. And when we're in Duncan, the only place to do that is here at the Duncan Garage. Let's go in and see what they've got. The garage really was a garage originally, but these days it's the cool place to eat and lunch times are always busy. There's a great choice and everything is vegetarian. I settled for nasi goreng, which looks delicious and sat down with manager Leela Ray Hamilton to find out more about their menu. Obviously we've got some fantastic main courses and, and savory options yes. here, but you've, you've decided to tease me here with some <laughs> lovely looking desserts. It's not a tease, I want you to eat them. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm glad to hear that. So okay. I, choo I chose two of my kind of favorite things right now. This is, we call it the Garage Gateau. Okay. It started out for one of our first cakes that was a gluten-free, vegan and a sugar-free kind of really? cake. So it's sweetened with maple syrup. And then this, so it's like a pumpkin ginger, almost raw square. So okay. gluten-free, vegan, sugar-free as well. Wow. So there is demand for these things, so we are that doesn't look like it could be sugar-free or vegan <laughs> or dairy-free or gluten-free at all because it just looks yeah. so delicious. <laughs> I'm converted. Okay. <laughs> Way back in season two, I visited Andrew Shepard, who had just started producing local sea salt. Back then, he was laboriously hauling seawater out in jerry cans and evaporating it over open wood fires in his Cowichan Valley backyard. So I thought it'd be really cool to find out how he's doing now, five years later. Andrew, we are a hell of a long way from the wood fires and the stockpots that we saw here, what, five years ago? Yeah, about five years, maybe a little longer. Yeah, yeah. So what do we got going here? I mean, presumably this is all, you know, high tech, High tech compared to? Well, yeah, I guess compared to uh, wood fires and, um, and and stock pots, but it's actually really old technology. Okay. We're running a hot steam system. Yep. Yeah. As you can see, we've got six kettles in here. We've got a couple more set up outside. Uh, it's the same concept. We fill our kettles up, we boil them down, we fill them up, we boil them down, and uh, the salt comes out. So it's all the same, except I don't have to get up five times a night to load the fires. That's got to be a bonus. Uh, it's very, very nice. Yeah. Although I still got to get up and top them up because she boils so hard. Okay. Uh, and before we used to produce about 150 pounds a week. Yeah. And now max capacity is about 1,200 pounds a week. So wow. there's so a, we're... a little different. When we last met you, you were wading out into the ocean and bringing jerry cans full of water back into your little pickup truck. Surely with all this capacity, you're, st you're not doing it that way by, or you have arms like Popeye. Yeah, I know, I know, and my physique probably shows we haven't hauled jugs in a while. Um, we've got a water truck. Okay. Uh, we still go to Cherry Point and pump all our water direct right. from the ocean, uh, but we take it 2,000 liters at a time with a jet pump. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a little different. I don't get wet anymore. Uh, so what's next for Vancouver Island Sea Salt? Uh, Comox Valley. So we are really excited to head up to Comox and be associated and, and tied right into the whole aquaculture scene right. up there. And we're very excited to uh, team up with Fortis BC and okay. start using natural gas, which we think is going to bring our, we, not we think, we know it's going to bring our carbon footprint way down, okay. even above and beyond the biofuel blends that we're using right now. We're always working to get our carbon footprint down and yep. we think natural gas, which is really established up in the Comox Valley, is going to help us go from green to super green. That's awesome. That's great to hear. This area's climate is ideal for all sorts of farming, including grapes. And Ali is visiting a vineyard which, alongside its grapes, is growing a reputation for its wines, Unsworth Vineyards. Chris Turek is showing her around. The Turek family bought the property in 2009, and they have been using some unusual grapes. So Chris, what type of grape are we looking at here? This is Marichal Foch. 
Okay. It's the oldest part of the vineyard. We inherited this block. It's about an acre. Uh, yeah, it's about a decade uh, decade old, and it goes into our Ovation uh, port style. Oh, I've had that. That's yeah. delightful. <laughs> and how many actual different varietals do you grow on in the vineyard? We have this block of Foch, and then uh, next door we have a, an experimental varietal, and then we have Labelle, Cabernet Libre, Amiel, so eight altogether. Is there a specific reason why you guys are using varietals that are not typical? Not heard of? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they were bred for Vancouver Island uh, to show disease resistance, especially powdery mildew and botrytis, okay. which plague this, this area, as they do most wine growing areas around the world. So instead of using fungicide, the varieties show uh, their own resistance without the use of a spray program. They also have some unusual <laughs> farm workers. <laughs> Jumping chicken. <laughs> yeah, they're our, our vineyard crew, are, uh, are doing some leaf thinning for us. Now, I told them to just take the basil leaves, but uh, that one missed, missed the, the conference. Chickens aside, Unsworth have some other environmental ideas at work. There's a lot of vegetative growth here because of the heavy clay soils and a lot of, uh, a lot of moisture. So we lay down this mulch, um, just wish wood chips uh, from, from the island here, and uh, they just actively suppress uh, the, the rye grass and the fescue that, that's, that's growing here pretty vigorously to allow the area directly underneath the vines to grow without competition. Now, the industry standards is uh, herbicides, you know, right. uh, which we don't have to use because we, we use a bit more painstaking of a, of a system, but it, uh, you can taste it in the fruit and you can see it in the vineyard and it looks nice too. <laughs> Unsworth may be a relative newcomer, but they already have an impressive winemaking facility and are producing around 10,000 cases a year. Oak casts are used for aging and they produce their own sparkling wines. The 12 acre property also features a restaurant and tasting room where chef Steve Elskins has prepared an amazing array of dishes to complement Unsworth's range of wines. Ali is in for a real treat. I see we're starting with the, the your bubbly, the Charme d'Ile. I'm super excited about this one. What are we going to be having it with? We're going to start with uh, smoked polenta fries, with uh, smoked cheddar and a curry ketchup. Now, Chris, why are we doing it with this? Well, with, with uh, fried elements, uh, fried food, I, I really like to go with bubbles. It adds a lift to the dish. And this style has a little bit of roundness to it. It's not kind of linear and austere like champagne. It's a little bit more round. So it can stand up to the, the cheddar, kind of richer elements, uh, and the smokiness for sure. Mmm. Very I, oh, good. Mm, my own food? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Next alley, we've got our lately seared albacore tuna. Mmm, one of my faves. Um, yeah, mine too. Um, it's paired with uh, a red beet, an olive tartare, and a tahini dressing. Okay. So I've chosen to go with uh, Unsworth rose to go with the tuna and beet salad. To me, beets have that lovely sweetness to them. Um, they're very earthy as well. Uh, and the teeny kind of uh, plays on that kind of earthy element. And the tuna itself is dialing it up in a little bit of a, a richer style fish. So our rosé is a little bit more delicate, but uh, I think the beets is, is the key, po key, key pairing. Okay. And then it has enough weight to stand up to the richness of the fish, but also the lovely brightness uh, in the rosé is going to leave your palate kind of clean and, and fresh and, and ready for the next, uh, the next course, so to speak. Is there a taste of the couch? <laughs> well, I think we're probably still finding it. Maybe the closest would be our rosé or pinot gris with, with regards to this is what the couch and specifically can produce. But we've only been at it for a few years, so we're still discovering. While Ali is enjoying those tastings, I'm getting my hands dirty. I'm at Providence Farm helping farmer Abe with some weeding. The farm was founded in 1864 by the Sisters of St. Anne, who ran it as a farm and a school for nearly 100 years before gifting it to the local community. For the past 37 years, it has been operating as a very successful therapeutic farm. We have our allotment garden system okay. and people from the community are coming in, getting a plot, and we have, like we said, 100 plots. People pay $35 to take those plots. Where these kitchen garden food is going directly from here, 100 feet up the stairs into the kitchen. Right. We're also growing food for uh, sale. And we have a three acre market garden down below in our lower fields uh, where we're growing, you know, 50 different type of vegetables. How many varieties of food are you growing here in, you know, in the gardens? So in these gardens over here uh, with our allotment gardeners, 
just just perusing through, I think I probably have seen in each in each garden two or three different varieties of every single crop they're growing, and everybody's growing ten to twelve crops. So, and then you got a hundred gardeners, so I don't know twelve thousand different varieties, maybe. Well, how's it going? Are, are, have you come to help? Well, no, I'm going to take you away. Oh, awesome. yeah. Abe, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> right, I, love, I love doing it. Well, my weeding break is over. Right. Executive okay. Director Chris Holt has arrived to show me around. We've got uh, um, many different, different types of folks that are coming out. So we have people with uh, mental health issues, with uh, uh, brain injury okay. and developmental issues. Right. And uh, they really come out here because this is their life out here. Yeah. Right. And so we have like over 80 people a week who come out and they work on the landscaping and work on our buildings and work on in our, our, our gardens. And some of them have been coming out for more than 25 years. The farming is so very important to, to what we do here from a therapeutic aspect, right? right? Because, you know, we help people that have a difficult time in the mainstream, sure. right? And part of it is, is that, you know, if you come out and you care for the soil, you know, it cares back for you, right? right? right. It really and is a symbiotic just, relationship. Very much a symbiotic relationship and really is incredibly therapeutic for people to come out and work with the land. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's really, it really works well. Welcome back to Duncan. Over the years I've visited most kinds of farm, but today is something completely new for me. I'm meeting up with Lynn and Jake at Mossy Banks Farm, and they're going to show me their free range rabbits in their unique rabbitat. This is the rabbit heaven, isn't it? We call it the rabbitat. The rabbitat. That's, the rabbitat. That was I like Jake's the sound of name. That. Yeah, yeah, my Jake's sister name. came up with that one. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. The rabbitat is a series of pens. As the grass in each area gets eaten, the rabbits move on to the next. They also get kitchen scraps to feed on. So it's it's as natural as you can as you can make it for them. Yeah, and then when these when the pens have grown properly in. Uh, we move them uh, day by day to eat different pens so that they're not overgrazing right. and the pen has a chance to recover. And you'll notice that there is fencing down at the base of the pen. That's to stop them digging out. Because if, if we look over to this side here, this was our first attempt, and you can see the huge holes right. in there. So is this fencing actually buried into the earth? No, it's just sitting on, on the ground, but the grass will grow through it and right. they'll eat the grass. But they can't dig out. You see, there's no holes here. And the holes there were so big that babies were hiding in them all night. Oh, okay. And we'd come up in the morning, the baby was sitting outside the, the gate. Where's my mom? They didn't walk out. <laughs> Those baby rabbits certainly are cute. What happens to them when they grow up? We eat them. We eat them. <laughs> These are all bred for, for meat. These are meat rabbits. They're not show rabbits, although right. some of them are very, very pretty. Yep. They're fantastic food. I mean, they are, they're the leanest protein that there is. They take up very little space to produce that amount of protein. The problem is getting over our, our sort of modern, uh, we live in a society that's fairly overfed, so we don't have to eat cute things. But, you know, I, I teach at the VIU campus as well as, as farm, and we are overrun with, with big, big rabbits because everybody lets their, their pet rabbits go there. And we have a cafeteria, we have a lot of students who are on tight budgets. I don't see any problems with, you know, the cafeteria serving rabbit every so often. I'm not sure if the rabbits agree with that. Well, that was great. I love seeing all those happy rabbits in their rabbit hat. And today we're going to make rabbit hunter style with mushrooms and carrots and onions in a low, slow, braised method. First of all, we have to cut the rabbit up. So here we have our beautiful little rabbit. We're going to cut this into 12 pieces, okay? We'll start off taking off the two front legs. So we just come in underneath the legs here and just loosen that little bit of skin that holds the legs in place, okay? And then we come down and just come in behind the joint, okay? Get the knife steady and there's our two front legs and then we're going to split those in half straight down the spine. Now we're just going to trim off that bit of spine from the, the middle there so that we don't have to worry about that once it's cooked. Then we're going to move on to the back legs. So once I do, again, just loosen that membrane, okay, down to the base where the 
thighs, and this is the hips on the back of the bunny. Just take the back there and separate that, and then you can come in from underneath. There we go. And just like we did with the front end, we're going to take both sides off of the spine. And this one I'm going to turn over because it's a little easier to do with it laying down flat like so. I'm trying to get in as close to that spine as I possibly can so I get all the meat off. And once again, once you get into the corner there, then you just find that knuckle. There we go. And again, that's going to go for stock. Okay. And then we've got what's referred to as the saddle. We're going to cut this into six. The easiest way to do this is just to split the spine. Okay. Poke your knife right through the middle. I'm just going right there across the back of the, the rabbit. Okay, so that's now split into two. And then I can take these two pieces and slice them into our three pieces here. That'll come down in between the ribs. So what I've got in here is a little bit of our flour. And you're always going to season your flour quite generously with the pepper and the salt. Just give that a little blend in there. Okay, and then you just toss all your pieces of meat into that flour and give it a good dust. And then you want to make sure you get all of the excess off. The idea is that you just want a nice light coating, just toss it between your hands so that you get that very, very light, delicate coating of flour on the rabbit. Pan is already hot, okay. Fairly generous with the oil. We're going to use the oil afterwards to make our roux. Nice moderate heat. When you're putting something like this into the pan, don't throw it in or drop it from a height because that's when the oil splashes and that's when you get burnt. You notice I can put my hand almost right down to the pan as long as I don't touch it. Once we've got them browned nicely, then we just lift them out. There we go. See, that's beautiful. That's just that nice golden brown that we're talking about. That will, of course, melt into the sauce once we add the liquid all browned off quite nicely. So while the pan is still hot, we're going to drop that temperature a little bit. Then we're going to go our one small diced onion. Now at this point, we're going to use the natural juices or the water that's coming out of the onion to deglaze the pan. And what that will do is it'll just lift any of that little bit of caramelized flour off the bottom of the pan. And we'll switch over here to a spoon, which I can use as a little bit of a scraper. Okay, a little bit of finely diced carrot. This is going to give us a little bit of color. Our nice cremini mushrooms, so brown mushrooms. You can use any kind of mushrooms that you like, really, but I saw these and I thought they're going to be really nice and kind of meaty, and they're going to give us that hunter component to our rabbit dish. So at this point, what I want to do is get rid of some of the moisture in the mushrooms. The mushrooms contain probably about 80% water. And we're pretty close here. Once you start to feel the bottom sticking again, that's a good, good indicator that you've got as much moisture out of there because, of course, now that moisture from the mushrooms is not deglazing the pan anymore. So now we have to make the roux. And roux is very simply equal parts of fat and flour. So I'm just going to sprinkle my flour over the, and then we want to just make sure that's mixed in. And at this point, you don't want to brown the flour anymore. So you got to work reasonably quickly and just move that around, okay? So that basically all the flour now absorbs the oil. Now, when you're adding your liquid to your roux, you want to add your liquid a little at a time. So I'm dropping the temperature right down here and a couple of ladlefuls. You'll notice how it, lots of heat in the pan. There we go. And then I want to incorporate that flour before I add any more. Because right now there's all these little tiny lumps of flour and fat and onions and all sorts of other things. Then we can give ourselves a little more of our stock. I normally add in three additions. Okay, and there comes our sauce all up to the simmer. Now, this is a little bit on the thin side right now, but that's okay. It will come out of the oven considerably thicker than it is now based on the amount of flour that is on the rabbit. So then we just take all of our pieces of rabbit here and we can slip those back in. 
and you want to try and get everything covered. Any juices that came out of the rabbit? Absolutely, they belong in there too. So all we want to do is make sure this comes back up to the simmer. We're going to throw a few sprigs of rosemary in for the cooking process, a little aromatic, and then lid on once we're up to the simmer, and then over to our oven. Two hands. And that's going to take about an hour to an hour and a half to cook. Well, I do love rabbit. There's nothing quite like it. And prepared in that way, the hunter style or cacciatore, it really brings out that earthiness and the sweetness and just a really interesting level of complexity. Now, one wine pairing I would suggest would be on the mark. On the Mark comes from Rocky Creek Winery, which is just up the valley from the rabbit farm. And uh, I think it would really complement uh, the cacciatore dish. Now, Steve did something different. Uh, he did not use bacon, which is traditional. Where On the Mark comes in is it actually does, to me, have a bit of a smoky aspect to it. So you get big, juicy fruit that can really balance like the heavy earthiness of the stew. And then it just adds that smokiness, which makes it a really fun playoff. Now, wine's not for everyone. There are the beer lovers out there, and I'm one of them. I'd like to introduce you to my favorite Spinnaker's beer, our Northwest Ale. It's a big, hoppy, North American style ale, but it's superbly balanced, uh, so you get a nice multi body, um, as well as that lemony acid from the hops. Now, I think it's that acid aspect that will really complement the cacciatore, but then the multi-body will also bring out that earthiness from the mushrooms. So I think that could be a really fun pairing.